Today's Q&A is sponsored by Corsair and their new Dominator Platinum RGB DDR4 memory available in white. That's right, the Dominator Platinum memory is now available in white, but if that's not unique enough for you, allowing you to further customize the memory are a dozen ultra bright, individually addressable Capilex RGB LEDs mounted in the top of the modules. Corsair also has a wide range of kits available, including 16, 32, 64, and even 128 gigabyte capacities with speeds ranging from 3200 to 4800 megahertz. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Welcome back to Hardware Unbox for part two of the August 2020 Q&A. Part two, so that means there's a part one. Go back and check that one out if you haven't already. That will be on the channel already. And yeah, lots more questions to get into. We've got Monitor Steve over here with his nice new 4K upgraded panel, even though the webcam is still feeding us terrible quality video. But there we go. It's 4K. What can you say? So think you're excited? Ready to get some answering some more questions? I could not be more excited. Let's, Let's get, get into, into it. this. All right, I've got this next one for you here, Steve, since you're up on all the GPU drivers. Does Navi still have driver issues? Uh, well, I haven't run into the major issues that people were reporting, like the black screen bug and stuff like that. So neither of us ran into that, uh, yep. really. But there are little bugs here and there, but I think that's always going to be the case. Like, for example, recently I was testing the 5700 XT with Tomb Raider, a shut off the Tomb Raider. I ran all my tests one day, it worked fine. It was like two days later, I launched up the game for some reason, I couldn't get into the display options menu. It just locked the game up and crashed. About a dozen other people reported uh, with like 5500 XTs, 5600 XTs, 5700 XTs, that they were having that same issue. So that could just be a, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what that is. I tried the previous driver and still had that bug. So I don't know if they've updated the game that's caused that problem. And now AMD has to update the driver. I, I'm not sure. There's always going to be little bugs and things like that. But as far as like major driver issues, I haven't seen any. It's been pretty smooth sailing with all my testing and my game playing the things I play. But I'm sure there are still some issues here and there. And I'm hearing people are still having problems uh, predominantly with multi-monitor you know, multi -monitor setups. So two, three monitor setups. That seems to still be a huge problem for Navi and just, I think, AMD graphics cards in general. Uh, not something we test or really you know, use, but I think that's probably one of the, the lingering issues that are still there. But the things like the Tomb Raider stuff I talked about, you know, I get those bugs with NVIDIA cards as well. I think there's always going to be hiccups here and there, but it's more just the major stuff like the the whole PC breaking stuff, like the black screen issue and all that. So Yeah, and it seems that stuff yeah. has sort of calmed down a bit from the, the mm -hmm. big blow-up issue that it was yep. however many months ago that was now. So, yeah. There's it's, definitely less reports that I'm seeing. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. It sort of reached... It feel, felt like it was really bubbling away after the launch of those products. It's sort of more and more mm -hmm. people were buying the GPUs, more and more people ran into issues, and it sort of all exploded. There was fixes, and now it's kind of in a bit of a better state but mm -hmm. i think amd still needs to do you know as much work as they possibly can to improve all their software side of things because it's going to be a big debate in the next coming mm. next generations you know even if performance is there these sort of things driver issues or even if there's not driver issues but at least the lingering perception that there are driver issues is going to cause amd problems so they really need to get on top of mm -hmm. that and make sure that they have the best software possible to really sell their products Right, next question is, any thoughts regarding Intel's ATX 12VO spec? So that's the new power supply specification that it cuts out. I think it's the 3.3 and 5 volt rails or something. Mm. So it's just mm -hmm. 12 volt rail and then the motherboard does the rest of the conversions necessary for your SATA devices and so on. I mean, it's interesting, but ultimately I don't think it's really going to become a thing for you know, D the DIY market. It might be a thing for OEMs, meeting efficiency standards or whatever, but for the DIY market, I mean, what, what's the incentive for them to yeah, move I'm, to I'm ATX 12 year Not sure. Like, uh, different sure plugs. It, it seems like a very complicated thing to change. Like, you can't just go and yeah. change a system that's been in, in place for so long with a new system and gain traction. So, I yeah, I just don't think it's really going to be a thing for the DIY market, for at least for a long time. Yeah, I don't really see the, the benefit and it seems like a bit of a messy solution, but yep. not sure on that one. All right, Steve, got another one for you here. 
Do you mm. expect six core, six thread CPUs, such as the 8600K, to adversely bottleneck the upcoming flagship GPUs, such as the 3080 or Big Navi? Could an upgrade to at least a next gen six core, 12 thread CPU be necessary to avoid leaving performance on the table with these GPUs? It's another one of those impossible to answer right now questions, but it's really more about the game engines uh, and the games themselves than it is like, obviously if the games that exist right now aren't using more than say six cores, then it's not going to matter. Uh, if you throw more cores at the problem, that's not going to fix it. What will help you utilize those faster GPUs is more frequency from those six cores. Yeah. So yeah, nothing's really going to change there. Okay, next question here. Should one care about motherboard VRM thermals unless they stress their CPU with long renders and similar workload? Okay, so this is one that I've kind of answered already multiple times in our VRM thermal videos. But basically, it's a tough one. Generally, no, you shouldn't worry because if you're not using all the cores of your CPU, and especially if you're not using a core heavy CPU, then you're not really going to stress your VRM. For example, all B550 or even B450 motherboards will run the 65 watt TDP parts just fine. So your Ryzen 5 3600, for example, the 3700X, doesn't matter the board, you can run those CPUs just fine. You can even overclock them just fine, no problems at all. So you really don't need to worry about VRM thermals there. It becomes an issue perhaps with those boards if you plan on upgrading in the future. Again, it depends on the workload you're running, but in the future, games may use all eight cores of a 3700X. Um, again, that CPU doesn't matter too much. Maybe when we get to the 3900X, when games become really core heavy, that can be a problem. But right now it's really about just doing a bit of research on your motherboards. So there's been some X570 board examples where boards are priced at the same price point. They have the same amount of USB ports. They have the same sort of Wi-Fi, the same networking support, the same sort of storage capabilities. So really the boards are neck and neck and the defining aspect can be VRM thermal performance. And we've seen some examples like maybe the MSI, uh, what was it, like the Gaming Edge, for example, had really poor VRM performance relative to something like the X570 Gaming Tough motherboard. Similar price, I would go with the Tough board because if you, in years to come, upgrade to a Ryzen 9 processor, whether it's uh, a Zen 2 or a Zen 3 processor, and then you decide that you want to do video editing or something that uses a lot of cores, maybe games in the future, you'll, you'll avoid throttling and you'll just have a better experience with that board. So that's another reason why they can be important. But really, yeah, the, we don't test them because you need to be worried about them on all the boards. It's just seeing which boards have higher quality VRMs and at what point does that even matter? All right, Tim, it's another one of those crystal ball <laughs> times. Are you ready? Yep. Get your crystal ball out. It's all it's serviced and working. Yeah, let's get it. Let's get it going. All right. Will 10 gigabyte of VRM be enough for 4K gaming with next gen games? Hmm. Well, as you can see, I've seen into the future for next-gen games, yes. and I'm going to go with no. No, I, oh. I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I'm assuming this comes about because of the leaks or, or rumors that some NVIDIA GPU is going to have 10 gigabytes of RAM. I mean, what are we seeing now? Is the GTX, no, the RTX 2080 Ti is an 11 gigabyte GPU, so that's pretty close to 10 gigabytes. I mean, we're not really hitting the VRAM buffer of that card now from 4K, are we? Uh, it really depends on the game. Yeah, there are some games where we are, or it appears that we are. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator is a good example of that. And that's sort of, we consider that to be sort of a next-gen game. So yeah. I would say you'd want at least 10 gigabytes for smooth uh, performance at 4K. I think 8 gigabytes is going to become the absolute bare minimum, but there'll be no real 8 gigabyte cards that can you know, have the kind of power required to deliver 60 FPS plus at 4K anyway. So that's a bit of a moot point, that one. Yeah, uh, and again, this, a lot of that comes back to consoles as well. Having 16 gigabytes of you know shared memory in the next-gen consoles mm -hmm. is going to quickly move the sort of target point for gaming from whatever mm -hmm. it is now to around that 16 gigabyte mark. Because we saw that with the previous-gen consoles when they moved to 8 gig, suddenly, you know, three, four gigabyte cards, which used to be the flagships, 
didn't have enough VRAM. So then they slowly started moving up to like your six, eight gig and beyond type products. So we'll see that again this gen. And yeah, hopefully these cards aren't too expensive to include all that VRAM. So we'll just have to see how that one plays out. Yeah, it's more of a it's more of a question of power, rendering power than it is VRAM. Because generally if they've got enough rendering power, they've got enough VRAM. Uh, and then for cards that you run on lower quality settings, like maybe a 5700 XT or... 2070 super type class card you would lower texture settings anyway and that solves for the most part the the vram issue why are gpus not just socketed like cpus i've had this question asked many 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 times over the years i can't remember the answers i've given at any one of those times but off the top of my head it's a gpu or a graphics card it's a package deal so it's it does it Basically, with a motherboard and the CPU socket, the platform, that's all designed around the CPUs for that generation and that platform. That's why we sort of saw AM4 get a bit tricky at at times because it was so broad. But with a GPU, pick up, you know, you, you can have a look at my graphics card collection and pick up three different cards and they'll be very different in terms of the power input. You look at the PCB, it'll be very different in length. The cooler that goes on it will be very different depending on whether it's entry level, mid range, high end. So they just have such different requirements that for them to be socketed, everything would have to look like those photos we've seen of like the RTX 3080 or whatever it's going to be called. It'd have to be this big monstrosity of a board. And that would be, you know, what you could socket in different GPUs because that would be able to cool everything. It'd be able to deliver power to everything across the board. It may even be inefficient with a lower end gpu yeah not just necessarily say, the cooling but the power delivery yeah, and then might be you can't do like itx stuff and, and small form factor yeah, exactly. stuff so they're really they're tailored designs for for what you're using yeah i was just gonna say you know it's what you're saying then makes it sound like it would be much more expensive to have like a socketed gpu design because you know yeah, it would be you're buying like a high-end power delivery system for like your low-end gpu that's going to cost more than the nice paired optimized solution of low end GPU, low end power solution. So, or alternatively, you're going to have to buy your socketed solution and then that doesn't have enough power delivery for your upgrade. So then what's the point of having different, what's the point of having the socket if you need to upgrade the whole socketed solution as could, well? Could you, and then memory is an issue like, too, like GDDR6, right. you know, you need the exact amount of memory. How's that going to work? It'd be very it just complicated. just doesn't. Yeah. And then could you imagine like the firmware issues? Oh, this um, drivers are uh, buggy enough as it is for GPUs. So we don't want socketing issues yeah. being in there and as then, well. Of course, the socket is made like this. The socket limits the way you access certain things, like the the PCI Express slot, like the memory. So, a socketed GPU would only work for a single GPU generation. So it just makes no sense. Like Turing wouldn't be compatible with Pascal. So yeah. you'd, you'd have to buy a new socketed car. And really, it would only be uh, designed for, the, like if it was the Turing uh, series, it'd be designed for the RTX 2080 Ti. And then could you imagine putting like an RTX 2060 or lower in that? Anyway, that that's the reason why it just doesn't really make sense. Yeah. All right, question here. Go with A520 or B450 motherboard. Interesting. Uh, off the top of my head, I would say B450 because, well, we know B450, at least most boards, should be supporting Zen 3 at this point, so CPU support shouldn't vary, apart from the fact that B450 can do a second and first gen uh, Ryzen as well. So you've got much broader CPU support there. B450 can obviously do CPU overclocking, which may be useful for uh, sort of budget-oriented processes like the Ryzen 5 3600, for example, you'll only be able to do memory overclocking. At least that's what, what yep. you should only be able to do on the A520. So uh, there's no PCI Express 4.0 on the A520 chipset. There's no extra USB or anything like that. In fact, I think the USB functionality may be better on B450, but don't quote me on that. I haven't got the... The yeah. specs in front of me. I think the main difference with A520 was the extra PCIe lanes you get off the chipset are PCIe 3.0 versus PCIe 2.0 sure. on B450. But outside yep. of that, there's a lot of other advantages, as you've been talking about, to B450, like your 
memory overclocking, broader CPU support, all that sort of thing, or CPU Obviously, overclocking, yeah. Yeah, A520, as far as I've seen at this point, they're just cheap motherboards. You're talking like $60, $70 yep. US, whereas for a B450 motherboard that's worth buying, you're looking at more like like the, the B450M Mortar Max, I think it's like $90. That is a significantly better quality board than any uh, A520 that I've seen. So you're spending anywhere from $20 to $30 more for that board. But I think that's the way I would go personally. Generally, I- I've said to viewers, avoid A-series boards. Uh, not a big fan of them. And yeah, all the A520 boards I've seen have no like VRM thermal cooling. So no <laughs> idea how they'd go with a Ryzen 9 processor in there. They're really designed more for OEMs. Like you get one, you put a Ryzen 5 3600 on there and then you throw those things away in a few years time together and buy a new motherboard and CPU. Whereas for the do-it-yourself market, it's better to get a good quality board that you can put a Ryzen 5 3600 on now. And then when a 12 or 16 core processor becomes cheaper, you can whack that on there secondhand. It's a really nice, cheap, easy upgrade. So that's why I prefer B450. All right, Tim, question here for you. It looks monitor related. Is there a big difference while watching two monitors that have 1000 to 1 and 1500 to 1 contrast ratio while sitting in a dimly lit room? I want to buy a new monitor to play some games with dark scenes and watch movies, but I'm not sure how much benefit I will get. So I'd say that because you're using it in a dimly lit room, there will be a difference for you. You know, 1500 is, you know, 50% better contrast ratio than 1000 to 1. So mm-hmm. you're going to get, you know, at least 50%, well, you're going to get 50% better black levels. So for me, based on a lot of the things I've seen, you know, typically if I have like an IPS monitor at 1000 to 1 set up next to a VA monitor that does 2000 to 1, so it's a bit, bit more than your example at double, um, in a dimly lit room, it's definitely noticeable that the VA panel has deeper blacks. Like you, you, when you see it side by side, it's very obvious. And I think that makes for a better experience in, in those dimly lit environments and games and that sort of thing. On the other hand, though, in a more brightly lit environment, so if you're looking like my studio here, for example, or just any you know interior lighting, overhead lighting, your standard sort of stuff, or some sun from outside coming into your room, I think that there's much it's much more likely you won't notice the difference. And some people disagree with me and they can tell the difference between the VA and IPS in like a brightly lit environment. But with all that light like reflecting off the display, it depends a lot on like the display coding. So how matte it is, how much graininess there is, how much reflections you're going to get. In the end, it ends up being pretty negligible. So I tend to recommend stuff like VAs with high contrast ratios. If you're gaming in dark rooms and you're going to that stuff matters to you. But if you're in a bright room most of the time, then it's really not that big of a deal, which is why I think a lot of IPS monitors are fine with a thousand to one for like your creative work. Creators tend to work during the day in offices and that sort of thing where, you know, that's, that's fine. So you wouldn't get as much benefit from VA. So that's kind of my answer to that one. All righty, here we go. The big question, Tim. <laughs> with the rumored 30 series of GPUs coming in at 1400-ish dollars, yikes, Uh, Do you think there's an upper limit to the price NVIDIA can charge for gaming cards? Well, if there is, you can bet your bottom dollar NVIDIA is in search of it. But really, well, there's two different scenarios. First of all, if there's no competition, they're going to try and charge as much as they can. And basically, that's determined by your willingness to buy their cards that cost well over $1,000. If people are snapping up $1,400 next-gen GPUs, then that's definitely going to be the price, and the next-gen may be even more expensive. Uh, The only thing that would definitely see that uh, soften is if AMD comes to the table with something that's really, really competitive, and it's you know $100, $200 cheaper, and NVIDIA sees their sales slow or hurt because of that. But yeah, it's really dictated by you guys. Um, it's funny when people blame reviewers for gushing over new cards and it's all our fault for high prices. It's like, mm, <laughs> don't think so. Don't think so. Reviewers can hype up and get excited about these things as much as they want. But if if you're not willing to part with $1,400 US, then it's not going to matter what they say. And sure, reviewers can get you, you know, they can hype you up for things and encourage you to buy them, I suppose. But at the end of the day, it's, it's people voting with their wallets. Um, so... Yeah, if that price, if it is $1,400, well, obviously, NVIDIA were happy with the 2080 Ti sales. I think they would be. I mean, you look at 2080 Ti pricing, even now, 
for new yeah. cards, and it's like did not come down in price since launch. Nah. It's been twelve hundred dollars no. since September of or whenever it launched in twenty was it twenty seventeen that the cards launched or twenty eighteen, whenever it was no, twenty eighteen. Was... Yeah, you're twenty eighteen. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 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 So when whenever it was, it's been well over a year now. Um, yeah, same price. So if they're happy with those sales, then yeah, I think they would attempt stuff yeah. like, well, all you guys are willing to buy twelve hundred dollars GPUs. We were they were flying off the shelves. So how does fourteen hundred dollars sound? They'll they'll test that market out, and as you say, it will depend on competition. I think though, that there's so many interesting things playing out with the, these cards and their pricing because. When you sort of look at it as well, the only reason they were able to, well, one of the reasons was no competition, but another reason they were able to charge $1,200 for a GPU and get a lot of sales for it is because the, all the lower tier cards were also kind of similar price to performance. So if you're already mm -hmm. a GTX 1080 Ti owner and you wanted more performance, then what was your choice? Well, it was to spend $1,200 US on a new GPU. So... If that is not no longer the situation and there's more GPUs, maybe there's two GPUs that provide more than 2080 Ti performance, or maybe the performance is the price to performance is a lot better and there's more options, then maybe it won't be as necessary or attractive for a $1,400 GPU, even if there's no competition. Because, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. if you could buy a 10% better than a 2080 Ti GPU for, say, $700, then would a 30% better card selling for $1,400, would that be attractive to people? I'm not as sure it would be. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that might happen there, depending on how the lineup goes. So next question is, with Ryzen APU's strong graphics performance and Intel's rumored graphics improvements with Tiger Lake, uh, what do you see as the future for NVIDIA's MX series and other low-power dedicated laptop GPUs? Well, I think there'll still be room for those parts. They just won't offer the same performance as they currently do. If you know an MX GPU is offering the same performance as an APU, there's no reason for that product to exist. They'll just make the MX GPU a bit faster and a bit better, and maybe it will consume a bit more power or whatever the situation is, but it will just continue to be that next step up from iGPU performance for whatever product. And there could even bit still be room for you know, similar to APU performance, you might have a like a cut down GPU like or cut down CPU like a Core i5 that you might want to pair with MX. Maybe an OEM wants to do that rather than choosing the Core i7 with the faster GPU option. So there's still going to be plenty of room for those parts. And we've seen products like I think it's the the Razer Blade 13, like a compact ultra portable using up to a 35 watt GTX. 1650 max q i believe it's called <laughs> don't don't quote me on that because those names are very confusing but yeah i believe that that's and that sort of gpu provides a lot more performance than igpu so there's there's plenty of options there that a company like nvidia has for low-end mobile products so they're not going away anytime soon it's the end of q a part two that means rapid fire questions part two let's get into it so steve Will you create a video tutorial for overclocking or undervolting with clock tuner for ryzen by one Usmus or Usmus, or, I think it yeah, is. whatever it is. Um, hmm. Well, if I have time, I'd like to. I, I definitely want to have a look at it. I haven't had a chance yet. We've got plenty of things in the works at the moment. But yes, if I get time, I'll create a video tutorial or something like that. I suppose. Tim, good God, can you please? Sh no, I'm not going to. No, no, move on. Read yeah. one. That All is right, disgraceful. Fair. I know it's uh, it's tough to read that question. I won't. Will not stand for that. <laughs> A video on integrated motherboard sounds, Steve. Is this something we should consider when buying a motherboard? Heavily upvoted. Uh, okay. I don't know. Maybe? I don't know. You guys tell me. Like, everything I use, like the, the high-end Logitech headset I'm wearing right now, it has a USB audio. Like, my soundbar's USB. I, I haven't used integrated audio in ages. It can make a difference for sure, but if you really care, a discrete solution is always way better. So I, I don't put too much emphasis or focus on it because most of the things I use anyway don't use it. And yeah, I don't know. You guys tell me on that one. Uh, Tim, would you consider testing newer games running on NVMe SSDs versus SATA SSDs versus hard drives? It was interesting to see this question in the uh, in the comments because... And it, and it was a bit upvoted as well because I'm actually working on something like that. I've got a whole big stack of storage devices that are currently going through some testing. And yeah, we'll have that for you shortly. Just been interesting sort of preview or data before we get into next-gen console testing where that might all change. Um, Steve, in regards to storage only, 
do you actually need PCIe Gen 4 or even Gen 3 if you're not relying on NVMe drives? Uh, well, you don't actually need it if you're not using it. Am I understanding that yeah, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tim, is gaming with uh, 1080p dead? Is gaming at 1080p dead? Well, not based on the amount of people that have 1080p displays or how, how they're still being bought and sold quite regularly. But I think for high-end mm. GPUs, it's probably approaching mm, dead territory. Yeah. Steve, um, are you planning a, a video on A520 motherboards? No, don't think so. I know, you, again, you guys let me know if I should, but I don't think so. All right, Tim, should one buy an RTX 3000 series GPU when it comes out in September and potentially pay a premium or wait until AMD releases their Navi 2X series? Yeah, I talked about this, this on the live stream. It really depends on how good the RTX cards are, the sort of value, performance, proposition, whether it's worth buying while they're in stock or waiting. But I think for a lot of people, it might make sense to have all the information available on all the GPUs before making a, a decision, especially if you're thinking of buying a very expensive product. Um, Steve, will you do VR gaming benchmarks? No, no plan at this point in time. I think we put a poll out asking if people wanted that and it was pretty underwhelming for the people that did want it. So. Not many people have headsets from memory either. Yeah, it's pretty niche. Not really something we're going to look at doing anytime soon. Okay, Tim, final one. What is the maximum practical size for a desktop 16 by 9 monitor regardless of resolution? Hmm. Well, again, it depends how far away you want to sit from your monitor because if you want to sit point blank like this far away, then you probably won't want something more than 27 or 32 inches. But if you're comfortable sitting a bit further away, then people, some people are happy with 43-inch monitors, maybe 48-inch. Can't see too much bigger than that being practical, though. All right. That's it for part one and part two of the Q&A series. There is a part three, but that is only for our Patreon questions. That'll be coming up on the channel shortly, but we've answered all the YouTube questions that we're going to answer in this one. Fair few interesting ones. We actually answered a fair few questions. I read every single question for this month's Q&A session this time around. Wow. So there's like three or 400 by the time I got up to it. So a couple in the normal section, a couple in the rapid fire section. And yeah, I think we've answered all the, the really compelling ones. So good job, you guys, for some great questions this month. Um, what else should we be telling people to do? Something like there's a sub button. Is it Subway? Yes. By Subway Subscribe, Subs? Subscribe, I think oh, it's sub Yeah, pronounced. subscribe. That's so right. So you can do that. You can also, there's a, a thumb up icon. That means that you thoroughly enjoyed the content yep. and you want to show show that. So do that. Uh, we have Patreon. That's yep. very cool. We just did our Patreon live stream this month, which is always a whole lot of fun. Answering questions live, talking about current tech and what's going on and what we have planned, all that sort of stuff. So we just did that. It'll happen again next month, though, so, you know, sign up if you want to see that. What have we got? Discord chat, Discord server, awesome community over there. Um, there's laptop section, monitor section. Tim's always in there talking monitor stuff. It's a bit of fun, yeah. It's a pretty, it, it's a good place to be if you're into this sort of stuff. Behind the scenes videos, you've just released a, a series of behind the scenes videos, haven't you, Tim? Yeah, that's right. I've got BTS on this studio space you see around here, so you can get a nice tour of what goes on on the other side of the camera, this side, your side, um, and then an office tour as well, which I think will have been published by the time this Q and A section goes live. So yeah, a couple of BTS videos, and hopefully we'll be publishing a few more. Cause We've been a bit slack on the BTS videos, but they're coming don't, back on the don't Patreon page. Tell them that there's heaps of really <laughs> heaps of good content. Go unlock it all. Nice. Go watch it all. You can watch years worth of BTS videos. Um, all right. Before Tim says anything else, I think we should wrap this one up. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. See you in the next um, one. Got in before you. You beat me. 